Hey there, my name is Cheryl, CEO of LifeWorks, founder of 24-Hour Woman. Welcome to Talent Innovation 2015. Today with me, Dr. Wayne Pennell, all the way from the US, and you are in for a treat because we'll be sharing with you the emerging trends, current situation, things that we have worked with with organizations that has worked and not worked for talent innovation, leadership, high performance, all the good stuff and all the things that you need to know going into the year forward or in the next 12 months as you plan out your talent strategies, your leadership strategies. So, but first of all, let me welcome Wayne. Hey Wayne, how are you? Great, Cheryl. <laughs> this is going to be a lot of fun because not only are we looking at talent innovation, we're also looking at some predictions we have for the year ahead as well. So we'll look at some trends, we'll look ahead. This is going to be, this is going to be a lot of fun. Yes. Well, for, for those of you that's on uh, and that's watching this right now, well, Wayne and I have been trying to come together to get this sharing session out to the audience, to, you know, to the, the community of people managers and decision makers, you know, the strategies that's needed to move your organization forward in a very complex and, and certainly a very much more volatile uh, kind of business environment. And we are seeing changes in the talent pool. So let's just, uh, we have about an hour. So I'm just going to jump right in um, and ask Wayne to share with us uh, what are the trends that he's seeing out in the US. And many of your clients, Wayne, I believe, are global firms. So you would also be seeing what's happening around the world. So what are some sure. of your thoughts? So my background is clinical psychology, and I brought, uh, I brought that to business about 30 years ago. And I've been able to do, essentially, organization development and talent development and leadership development, working with some senior executives and some major groups across the country. Um, you know, I'm, I am a high-performance coach, certified high-performance coach. I focus on leadership. And what I see are pockets of uh, really creative talent per percolating up. You know, what happens is that more and more senior leaders are recognizing the need for creativity. And what's happening is they become uh, either, well, I'm, I'm actually seeing a polar split. So either it is my way or get out, or it's our way. And what's interesting about that is that it's very vision-based. And so our way is based on what vision are we as a group, a collective group, after? Where are we headed? And once the talent pool that comes on is really well informed about what the vision is, it's, it becomes their choice whether to stay and contribute toward that vision or whether to say, well, that's not the vision for me. I want to find a different company. So the old, the old style was... You know, you come to work, you learn to sit at a desk for eight hours, you learn to do your thing, that is it. This is more, there's more collaboration that I'm seeing in the workforce. And um, what I'm also seeing is that the enlightened leaders, the enlightened leaders are the ones that are actually calling for that. They are looking at individual differences and, and making cross-departmental teams so that individuals can talk together and there's no more silo. Right. Actually, you know, we are seeing some similar developments uh, on our end and um, as you know, we do a lot of work with regards to the generations in the workplace and we are in the midst of the huge crew change with baby boomers that will be potentially leaving the workforce and lots of the millennials coming right in. So we do, right. see, we do see people taking a lot more control with regards to the, the work that they do. And smart leaders, like you say, contemporary leaders realize that the demographics are changing, uh, sure. just like their marketplace is changing. So leadership is also um, the, the new leadership we see that is going to be successful now and going into the future are those who um, are able to build commons, find common ground, are people yeah. who are able to have a dilemma and be able to decide upon a dilemma because there's no good, I mean, any solution is not the perfect solution, but they have the courage to, to take that forward. And importantly, there are people, you know, join them in it because they find that it is meaningful, they find that it is aligned, and they find that their voices are heard. 
and I, I thought that when when I was preparing for this, I thought that's interesting because one of your key message as you work with leaders going forward uh, is about meaning making, isn't it? It is actually right, and you can see right back here, meaning maker leadership is my uh, it, it is my website, meaningmakerleadership.com. And really what I start with there is uh, the definition of the, of the self. You know, every leader... See, I believe that leaders have to be... In, in, I believe many things about leaders. The first is that just about everybody is a leader. It doesn't matter where you are in an organization or at home or in the community. If, if you're being noticed or watched, it could be even by your kids. It could be by a small group of of work colleagues. If you're mm -hmm. being watched, you're you're potentially a leader. Absolutely. I, I believe that to be a good leader, you have to be good in relationships. You have to be good with understanding other people, and I think that to be good in relationships, you have to be really strong in yourself. So I actually have seven steps in, in Meaning Maker Leadership that I walk people through, and uh, that's what I look for in a really strong in a really strong organization is does the leader have a good definition of self? Do they know who they are, both personally and professionally? Uh, the the second thing, do you want me to talk about this now or should I go into it later? Uh, well, we can go into that later. In, in fact, um, as you know, in a couple of months' time, we're going to host a special, uh, again, another special webinar where we will focus just the entire hour on, on leadership. But it's okay. good to know uh, if they need to find out more information is meaningmakerleadership.com, right? Exactly. Well, exactly. And you, you brought in two interesting trends that we are also seeing here in Asia, uh, uh, that of increasing uh, need for the workplace to be collaborative and that the leader needs to be one that is able to know about themselves but also be able to help others find the meaning and alignment. Absolutely. And, and we see a lot of that as we work actually, the, uh, the trend that we are seeing here in Asia, increasing uh, diversity in the generations at work, in the culture, gender and generational diversity and that's a key area that we focus on uh, at, at LifeWorks and um, we see that the leader plays a, a critical role in building a more inclusive workplace. Right? And, yes. and that's why for us, uh, we define it as, are you a contemporary leader? Are you able to embrace whatever that's happening you know, in your talent pool and in your businesses and, and bring that forward? So, so and, let's, and talk the, about, let's talk about contemporary and, and embracing whatever's happening because I think, you know, diversity was such a big word that was that was pushed around since the 80s, maybe even before that, mm -hmm. and it has taken on different meaning over time. And I think what we look at now is as the workplace shifts, and we are looking at millennials and <laughs> and even what's, what's called the indigenous digital generation, right, that they are born into digital, yes. digital. They won't even know what a record is, right? They won't know what a oh, yeah. how to read a how to read a, a watch that's got hands. So indigenous digital. Um, so the millennials, right? Uh, as we get a workplace like that, everybody actually comes with with a different background, and it's not about ethnicity. Where I think diversity used to be about ethnicity, now it's about what do you bring. Who are you? What kind of talent do you have? And, and that the mixture is really very different. Um, what we look for in a diverse workplace is very different. You know, and being able to draw on each individual's strengths, I think that's the sign of a great leader, is to recognize what strengths does this person bring versus this person. And what's great when you really, really look at, at diversity is that there's an overlap and that there's m actually more commonality than there is diversity. Absolutely. And so rather than pushing away, you get this, this commonality with this special flavor or perspective. And that perspective is what makes for really strong organizations. Yeah, and, and the thing, you're right, absolutely right to say that the, the definition of diversity has evolved. And we're not talking about more the physical experience, uh, no, appearance anymore, but more in terms of the diversity of thoughts. You know, right. Because that is the, the, the genuine value that you bring to the organization, the diversity of thoughts. And therefore, the leadership that is able to cope with you know, the diverse um, 
thoughts that comes into the workplace and be able to funnel it down such that people do see a common ground, right? And mm -hmm. and that's and that's what we see in terms of, of the trends as unfolding. And as we get into work with some of the organizations, uh, we, we are able to test out certain strategies um, that has helped them to be successful. Uh, one final thought about trends, though, um, is as far as, I, as Asia is concerned, we see the impact of technology, huge uh, impact mm -hmm. in terms of when, where, and how we work. Right and when, where, and how we communicate and engage with one another. Uh, what are your thoughts on on your side? Well, you know, even even what we're doing here, Cheryl, is a big tribute to technology. I mean, I'm sitting in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area in California, and you're in Singapore. And um, the fact that we can host this essentially on different days, right? Um, you're in one day. You're you're living in my future. Uh, and, and I think that that's fabulous because I think what we're seeing is the ability to cross-collaborate using, using technology that's now available. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, this was barely emerging and nobody used this kind of technology. It wasn't, this specifically wasn't available at all. And so the ability to gather new information, to pick certain pieces that are useful, and then to incorporate them into the specific work site, I think that that's available in an instant and that the really good leaders are looking for people that can do that. And so what we do, you and I, is to really help those leaders to find those people or to help those leaders to use filters so that they know what they're looking for. And that's, you know, you and I are, are helping organizations to be able to get to get faster at doing this kind of communication and to to look at um, you know what works in terms of communication. Yeah. I want to do I, I do want to say one more thing if if I'm allowed to go on a riff here <laughs> for a minute. Certainly before we head on to the next section. <laughs> the I think the other thing that's true in in uh, in terms of high level communication and technology is that we do need to go back to basics. That there's a, there's a certain level of, wow, while I'm able to communicate via webcam across multiple continents around the world, also there's a certain level of um, decorum, uh, being able to use language in a way both with text, because that's really fast and efficient, but very often misunderstood. With email, again, tonality is missed. And I think it's back to basics for leaders especially, but also the, the work teams who are trying to communicate with each other and with their leaders to look at what's called metacommunication. Mm -hmm. I mean, 38% of what we communicate is through our tone, right? We could, we could express joy just by having, right, just by having our voices go up. Um, or, you know, something's oh so serious, then we get deeper and lower. Uh, and so through tonality, 38% is that is of what we communicate comes through that way. And 55% comes through in our facial expression and our body language. And I think that leaders and e even uh, the workforce, the general workforce, often forgets that. And so in the midst of emerging technology, I think it's really important that we go back to basics as well and use that as an anchor. And it ties back right into... The, the trends that we are seeing in terms of having a more diverse workplace definitely. And, and definitely communication and how we communicate, when, where and how we communicate um, would really be the ones that would build the, the platform for inclusion, right? So we've, exactly. um, we've got more people joining us, Wayne. So well, for exactly. those of you who have just joined us, welcome. Uh, Dr. Wayne Pennell and myself have just been talking about what are some of the emerging trends that we are seeing in terms of talent and leadership um, uh, based on the work that he's doing out in the US with global firms uh, and myself uh, in Asia with global firms and with the uh, regional and, and local entities. I want to move on and because we've just, we just want to make sure that we keep on to time is um, we... Uh, See, that's a, we that's a, 
that's a productivity uh, uh, strength that you have, and I think that's that's also one of the things that makes for a really solid leader. So, very good. Keep track of time and keep us going. Yeah, go Cheryl. Because I I think that the next to topic we're going to get into because of all this in um, emerging trends, talent innovation and leadership sort of uh, that there's a there's a merger in some of the traits and skill set. Uh, and teams uh, that are being built up that I am seeing um, as we go into the future. And one of the fundamentals, I believe, is how can we build each individual become a high performer, just as the leader is a high performer, but right. in different arenas and in different roles. And I mean, um, both of us are certified high performance coach, and we all know we are, we are like rare breed, right? 150 of us at most. Um, <laughs> And I think it's important as part of talent innovation, how can we help the individuals, number one, find mastery again, number two, uh, be aligned and find purpose, uh, and number three, be able to have that freedom because they are high performers. They are okay. not going to um, so-called underperform or not contribute to the team and to the organization. So I want to touch a little bit on the work that we do or you and I do with regards to high performance with the organizations we are now working with for organization effectiveness and what are some of the things that had worked, had not worked and how should we be experimenting with this? What are your thoughts? Nice. Well, you know, I'm going to go back to vision and values. That's the place that I start. So people can't align with any kind of movement if they don't understand it. And it's really up to the leader to convey what his or her what his or her values are for the work process, for the work projects, and for the vision ahead. And to really look at what lies ahead. Where where does this department? Where does this project? Where does this this unit, this division, or this whole uh, this whole business entity? Where are we heading? And that's really up to the leader to make that clear. Where are we heading mm. in the next one year, two years, five years, right? So um, I always, when I start, in, even in looking at high performance, I start, with, um, I start with vision, I start with values. And, you know, in high performance, we look at five different areas. We look at clarity being number one, energy, courage, productivity, and influence. Those are five key areas, and when yes. we can get when we can get clarity about where we're headed, when we can get clarity about who we are, when we can get clarity about what we want, then it becomes the task to communicate that. And so that is gigantic. And that's how you get from being a high performer to being a super high performer, is to be able to engage the team because they're clear that you believe in where you're headed. So right. I think as a, as a leader, you're going to want to develop those skills. Yeah. And and so what we have done with regards to high performance is we work with leaders uh, on those areas, but we also work with individuals, right, in the area of yeah. clarity, energy, productivity, and, and impact and influence because uh, they impact the day to day, and it actually does impact the final outcome that you see. But yeah. what we have also done is we have stepped. We are now in step with the human resource team, with the operations team, etc., to look at what does it mean then, you know, to engage them in terms of clarity. The, and so the skill of storytelling becomes something that we we help, you know, uh, leaders with um, to be able to uh, you, saying it once and in an email or in a town hall does not cut it. You need to repeat what you say consistently over seven times before they actually realize that yes that's exactly what you know that is needed from me they finally understand there's greater clarity um, the other thing that we see working with the human resource team uh, in terms of structures and practices is really helping the uh, getting them to help the leaders to understand what it means right to uh, to enable each uh, voice in the room to be heard so that there's yeah. greater level of impact and influence for their team members and therefore there's greater autonomy, right? So all the fundamentals that Daniel Pink talks about in terms of yeah. the new science of motivation. Um, sure. The other thing that we have, uh, we've seen successful 
organizations uh, and certainly their, their internal managers and that the HR teams work on is how do we build a culture? Again, it goes back to the piece. How do we build a culture where each talent counts? Yes. So it goes back to my work around diversity and inclusion, but about how how can HR uh, and senior management now not view one size fit all, but every yeah. talent counts, and therefore every talent's way of gaining clarity of what he does mean to the organization or what the organization expects of him and what what you know and in terms of productivity how does how do we help and that's my belief about people in organizations uh, it's the role of the managers and the leaders to remove the barriers to our team doing great work I right agree. and and that's what and that's what motivates me to be hosting talent innovation and the talent and leadership innovation um, kind of conversation because I believe that it is that's where it starts uh, and, and you said two things that I'd like to underscore one is that leaders need to repeat their message seven or eight times before it's heard and when I don't know about you but when I've conveyed that to leaders when I've told them that they're like why can't they get them the first time why can't they get that the first time and and so the key is not you repeat yourself over and over and over again because that is that puts you in a parental tone in a parental mm -hmm. place and you'll get a childlike pushback mm -hmm. where people just won't want to hear it so you repeat yourself in different ways and you repeat yourself with different media and i think that using uh using a video message using an all staff meeting using a follow up email to convey what you want to say is really important the other thing you said is how do you get involvement? How do you get people to feel appreciated? And really, you know, study after study after study since the early 80s has confirmed that what makes a person feel good about work is not pay. That's usually number five on the list. Among the top things are they want acknowledgement. They want to, they want to know that what they do matters. And so if you're not taking the time to verbally high five like I saw you do this thing that was fabulous it matters it it matters to our project if you're not taking the time to do that you're killing the project the other thing that I do with my teams that I work with is I encourage verbal high fives amongst team members and that's like if you see this behavior happen and it's part of what we're trying to build as a culture high five each other just like walk by and high five or say something like nice going you know acknowledge each other because I think that has been a trend and I think it's something we can change I think moving forward we can turn into we can make a culture of appreciation and gratitude uh, that's part of culture and that is part of success as a matter of fact Absolutely. Uh, gratitude and, and, and empathy are, are both highly co correlated with success Right, and we see we see this uh, um, if the high five pieces showing gratitude and appreciation piece so so critical, particularly with the uh, younger generations coming into the workplace, where you know uh, they they can't wait for the entire year for you to say great job, right? So uh, something that has worked very well for our, our um, clients is that we empower every individual team member. To show the appreciation, to reinforce the behaviors that we want to be seeing in the workplace, rather than just waiting, you know, for the leader or the manager to be the only ones, uh, to be the only ones doing so, and therefore there is an elevation, uh, uh, and and in the workplace it becomes more dynamic. There's more positivity, and you know, in terms of talent innovation, that the, I think the application here for talent innovation is that to create practices that will create that will enable us to have a more uplifting organization because everything else going around there's a lot of doom and, and you know, downward spiral but if your organization is able to create engagement through having a workplace that's more uplifting then that is an organization that will immediately have that buzz of that difference it's true and there's there's a word you you implied but left out and that word is fun right that what we're seeing more and more is um, you know we've we've got a culture that comes from gaming 
right? The, the, that video games are part of the culture from very early on at this point. And so now to put gamification is, is the verb, or noun, I guess. Um, <laughs> to, to gamify is the verb. Um, when, when things become something worth working toward and everybody's pushing toward the same thing, and there's some level of, wow, I can see it, I can see it, we're almost there. And you've got the leader both acknowledging what the direction is as well as looking back and, and acknowledging uh, individual contributors. The, the key to this is not to make anybody feel like a loser over and over again. It's like, oh, employee of the month. That, mm. it, that very seldom works. Um, because employee of the month means that nobody else is is worthy of recognition, and so it's really important that the leader goes, "Wow, you contributed in this way. Look at where we got. You contributed in this way. Look at where we got." And and to make it fun along the way, and that's where again, you know, meaning meaning maker leadership asks for the leader to pause to find those places, right? Where is it that you're actually making a difference with your team? Right. and that your team recognizes that they're making a difference in the project. That's exactly what we, we work with with organizations around the different generations at work. You know, we, we do a lot of work around optimizing generations in the workplace. And like you say, you know, find the, the right way of delivering your recognition. I think all of us you know, have good intention. Uh, we all want to reward you know, the people for doing a good work. But often the way that we are rewarding and acknowledging them they are shying away because they, they, I don't feel that I'm being rewarded. In fact, I, I feel that I'm being punished. Yes. That, that one, one oh, of right. the, yeah, one of the pieces that I always tell my, my uh, client is, you know, what do we do when we find that we have a high performer? Right. You we, usually them give them, we usually give them more work. And right. as far as a high performer is concerned, why should I be a high performer when I'm just increasingly being piled up and choked up with work? Um, exactly. Yes, there's a, there's a, a, a place where you think that there's a, there's a high potential, but be able to talk to them about it instead of just layering work and upon work on them rather than they, when they look across and say, hey, what's that guy doing? So when, when, we, when you have a complex and diverse workforce, um, you need to be, be mindful about the kind of reward and recognition, about how yeah. frequent it is, Right, so so not just the HR, but people managers, they are the closest to the talent. Yes. Yeah, and and that's where we see a lot of innovation coming through because then the people managers themselves are the ones who think through. These are the people that's on my team, and this is what would work in collaboration with the HR teams and and the diversity inclusion team to structure things that would work. Because it, you know, even if you have a lot of investment, if it's not working, it's wasted investment. Right, right, right. So I mean, that's that's the other thing is uh, let's talk investment. A lot of a lot of times, um, leaders or managers who are also leaders, but uh, along the way, they think that the best incentive is to give their team members money. And again, I mean that. <clears throat> well, that's number five on the list. Let's talk about why. Because if someone gets some money along the way, what do they expect the next year? What do they expect the next time around? And what if they've contributed more, but you're only giving them the same amount? Only. Right? And so what that does is it sets up an expectation. It sets up a culture of entitlement. And it's like, well, I worked twice as hard this year, and I got the same amount. Forget it, you know? Um, and unfortunately, that becomes a setup for for embezzlement in an organization. It, it's you know, I'll take a few pencils, I'll take a a ream of paper. That I deserve it. I've worked hard, um, and so that shows up in different ways. And so, the reason I'm bringing it up is to caution our our leaders who are watching this that um, it, it's really important that you don't set up a culture of entitlement and the way to make sure that doesn't happen is to catch people doing things right. You know, be out there. Show them that you're invested in the process. Yeah. The other thing is yeah. to invest Sorry, in your team. Let me just give a quick example about catching yeah. people doing things right. I, we were working with a, a company and this CEO has this habit. He goes around with his handphone and he will, he will just go and snap pictures. But he will snap pictures of what is happening right. 
and then he will send this picture to the department heads and the division heads and say, this is, this is what I saw and it's great. And it is for then the department and divisional heads to communicate to that specific person who have made yeah. that happen. So the whole chain, uh, so there's a, and he basically then created a whole movement of let's catch people doing right. Because we are very good in catching people doing wrong, right? And, and actually, we, we, our eyes are trained for that. Um, True. So, and, and that, um, over the, la the last 12 months, have enabled them to create a more positive environment, and an environment where people are eager to do um, that which is value-adding. Yes. Sorry, yes. I disrupted you. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all good. So... Um, I think I was just talking about investment, right? The yes. other the other part of investment, right? So, yes, catching people doing something right has to match the vision, right? So it's one thing to say this person did something right to tie it to make it really strong and to tie it to, and that matches the vision of our of our program, of our process, of our company. Yes, let's celebrate that, and it keeps the vision in front. Where I was headed also was the investment in the individual. That paying somebody is different because it's just, it keeps them at arm, arm's length. But if you really find out what they're interested in and you want to invest in them, then to develop a high performer by increasing their knowledge, their skills, or their abilities, their KSAs, right? When we talk about KSA, knowledge, skills, and abilities. When you invest in them, you are showing them you care about them. Yeah. And you make them a part of the process, and then because you've invested in them, it does build loyalty. You do get that payoff of someone wanting to show you what they've learned and in investing of themselves then into the company. We are seeing this at play, uh, particularly uh, with the younger generation, right? Uh, the more you build, um, the more you invest in them, in the sense of knowing what their aspirations are, their dreams are. And I know many of the people on the call might say, oh, they want to be the top of the organization in 18 months. That's not going to happen. Right. Well, you know, if you know that that's their aspiration, how can we help them, number one, understand what is needed to be at that seat? And number two, if they are really interested, how we are willing to invest with them so that their dreams and aspiration becomes part of our process of developing the pipeline. And we have yeah. seen organizations uh, who invested time, and I'm, I'm not saying that it's going to be, you know, it's going to be easy, but investing time and energy, having that conversation, building the structures to scaffold them, if they are committed, and that's where the element of, I wouldn't I would push that far to say loyalty, but I would say that the element of retention is possible because you are intertwining things like career management, things like learning and development, things that I, I respect that you have an aspiration. Uh, let's work together. There's a sense of collaboration. So that all works very well for, for the younger generation that's coming in. It works for everybody. Yeah. It, w it works for everybody. I mean, if you approach with respect and collaboration and mm -hmm. show a need to invest or a desire to invest, you do that with anybody at any level. I'd say especially with the younger generation, but mm -hmm. I don't want to yes. exclude those that have been there for 20 years that are like, well, I know how this works, da da da, right? If you've got somebody who's at this place where they're, where they're, they've been there, they know how it works, they, they just want to do their job, if you showed up differently as a leader with that person, you could guide them. You could make some movement because they're used to you being a certain way with them. They're used to them being a certain way in the job. And I think that it's really important that we look at whether people are in the, in the wrong job or whether they're in the job wrong, right? And so it's up to us as leaders to come and develop them yes. to see what yes. they're interested in. Uh, the the um, area that I wanted to, to touch on was is that for, for the baby boomers, right, and, and actually looking at the talent shortage that we are seeing right now um, right. Is, is about the, 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 the right fit of the person. And you can find the right fit for a person on a full, full loop you know, perspective, then knowing the person's aspiration or knowing your potential uh, recruits, you know, staffs, 
uh, aspiration would be helpful for you to tap on in terms of your, of your recruitment and your retention strategy. So one of, one of the things that we have been helping for companies is in terms of helping them transit so-called their potential baby boomers who might be thinking of retiring. How can we help them evolve into a different career but still within the organization, a different work pattern? So the whole, you know that I'm very passionate about flexibility at work because I no. think it's such a wasted you know, uh, effort of you having invested and trained you know, um, individuals only for them to leave after X number of years with you. But if you know the aspirations, if you know what they are facing in that life stage, flexibility of carving out when, where and how work gets done, and, and still it's important that work gets done, uh, sure. helps you to tap on the talent pool that you might not have before and help you to keep the talent pool that you have already invested in. Right. Do you, see, do you see that um, flexibility is going to be an increasingly critical tool? Because I, I feel, as I look across organizations, we have, we have all the levers at, in our hands. We have tapped on the financials, compensation and benefits. Uh, we have tapped on uh, management development, you know, communication. All the engagement factors that we are seeing uh, for talent management, for talent innovation, we have tapped on like four to five, very consistently over like, my goodness, five, 10, 15 years. What's new I see as talent innovation is, is in terms of flexibility, in terms of a more contemporary leader, and in terms of being, uh, of, of embracing diversity of thoughts by creating a more inclusive workplace. And these are the four things that I see will bring us forward. And I'm, I'm moving really right into what, you know, we have, we have talked about the trends, we have talked about what has worked in organizations, and now perhaps sharing with the, the people that's on the call, what do we see going forward? What so would I you love, say as going forward? Well, I, I just love that you use the word flexibility. I think that that's a gigantic word. I think that it is often missed. You know, I when I'm working with leaders, I look for two things in my leaders. One is one is credibility. Do they say what they mean and do they do what they say? And the other is flexibility. And so it goes back to vision. Are they able to say we are headed this direction and I'm putting you in charge and I really don't care how we get there. I mean, I have some ideas. This is what I think we should do, but Ultimately, we're going to end here, right? We're going to end right here. So how do we get there? And sometimes it's back and forth, you know? Um, and so the flexibility of I have a vision for where we're headed. I think that the communication that happens, I think that that's got to go back to basics. And, and when I say that, I, I don't mean going back to the way it was in the, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, where... Um, communication in an office place was oh so stern. I mean, there were definite roles that a person had and they couldn't break out of this box, you know. I think that the flexibility to have less boxiness is going to be what we see. That the ability to communicate beyond boundaries of within a cube is going to be what we see. Yeah. And that the ability for cross-collaboration is also going to be something that we're going to see more of, where um, you're going to see you're going to see innovators become salespeople, and you're going to see you know the and the salespeople are going to be innovators. I mean, nobody expects someone who sells a product to actually think about you know what they could create that might actually be make that product better. I mean, no, people didn't used to think that, but I think coming forward, we're looking at it doesn't matter what your role is, we want you as a contributor. And so when you're talking about leaders as, as being flexible, I do look for credibility. Do we have a vision for where we're headed? And flexibility, can we gather information and then put it into implementation mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense to get us to this place we said we were going to go? Yeah. You, I want to pick up the point where you say we're going to work um, a lot beyond the cubicles. Because one yeah. of the key things I, I think going forward, we're going to see an increasing uh, um, need of the increasing use of virtual teams. By virtue of the fact that the talent is, is all over the world right now and, all, and, and to find the right fit 
for the kind of jobs that you that so called the jobs that is con in a, the jobs today may not be the jobs you know in the next couple of months. So having the virtual teams is one of the key things that I see. Um, I know we have been having virtual teams for the longest time, but really harnessing the uh, value of a virtual team and having leaders who are comfortable to be leading virtual teams because you don't see them. So again, going back to flexibility, virtual teams is, is going to come into play. How do you oh, measure virtual. performance when you don't see them? How can you ensure, how can you just make sure that they are contributing without the usual suspect of, you know, how long have they been at the workplace? Did they leave work early? You know, so the whole notion of flexibility is not just going to be when, where, and how work gets done. It's going to be flexibility in terms of careers, flexibility True. in terms of deployment, flexibility in terms of matching the life stage so that there's continual engagement with the talent that you already have. The other piece that you picked up, well, uh, I picked up from, from what you've just reflected on is um, that of values, going back to the basic of values yeah. and, and um, valuing contribution, right? So increasingly, uh, whether job descriptions is going to be sufficient or do we, we will increasingly need managers and teams to be empowered to say, this is the outcome that we want to see. Well, that's and, the key, yeah. right there. That's the key. We're gonna we're gonna be focusing more and more as we look at at the virtual workforce. We're gonna be focusing more and more on outcomes based evaluations, right? That's the outcome we want to see. Where this brings us back, Cheryl, is almost full circle to how do we how do we verbally high five? How do we catch people doing things right if someone's around the the world, right? And so. The flexibility piece is for the leader to keep his or her fingers on the pulse of every little process that's going on so that they can acknowledge it, right? So that they can say, you know what, this outcome appeared, thank you, it contributes to the whole in this way. Right. Fabulous, right? And so it's not necessarily, I saw you do this thing, but it's an outcome. This little piece of the whole process makes a big difference. Okay, I'm just going to pause there before we go more into what we see happening and how can we be prepared for it. Uh, the, those of you on the call, if you have any questions based on what we have just discussed, go ahead and send me um, your question in the chat box and I will catch it and then we will either answer it on this call or we will have a follow-up. Uh, if we run out of time, um, but feel free to put in your questions right now uh, for Wayne and myself. Um, we, we spoke about the trends, if you have any questions about trends, if you have any questions about the work that we have been doing and the success that we have been seeing with our clients uh, based on what they have implemented and you have questions around that, or you have questions that will help you elevate some of your concerns um, moving forward in terms of talent uh, innovation and in terms of leadership um, development going in to the next 12 months. Right, or if you're coaching a team and, and have questions about how to, how to move your team or to move a team you're not even working with but you, right. that you want, you want to help. The other piece that I see that would be increasing in importance is that of having high performing individuals and high performing teams. I'm not I mean I'm not going to talk so much about leaders we expect leaders to be high performance because you need to be bringing that team along, right? So how about and you spoke about every individual on the team is a leader, right? And, yes. and I told I totally believe in that. And we've also talked about in going to the future a job description may not be the all encompassing it's about how we develop, deliver the value to our our customer. Exactly. Um, I read an interesting article the other day of, uh, about Michael Dell and how they they are finally they are seeing fruits of privatization once again about how how innovation how people how people engagement is getting better and how they see that they're actually building value for their customer and that's where I I think uh, is one of the key um, things that we want to see going into the future um, for for organizations. So what are your thoughts? How can we, um, how can we encourage non-performers to become, first of all, a performer, and then from a, from a performer to become a high performer? I, that's a, a question that I've often been asked. 
<laughs> I would like to hear your thoughts around that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I've I've had the pleasure of dealing with teams with that problem, you know, and and here's somebody who uh, is perceived as a non-performer. Now, you know, you you said that we expect leaders to be high performers, and the truth is that leaders don't. Sometimes leaders have been promoted to a place without actually that they have the position, but they don't have the skills. Right, and so they are leaders based on based on their positioning, not based on the fact that they actually can lead. And so, I think it's really important for any of us to say, okay, maybe we're stuck. Maybe I'm stuck. Um, and and so then back to the question of, well, how do you get somebody who's not performing at a certain level to get to that next level or to to get on board? And again, there are a couple of, of ways to do that. From my perspective, I see it as uh, it, it is a conversation that is based around the visions and values of the company. You know, the, there's an expectation that people contribute in a certain way, and then um, and then there's a choice of are you going to be contributing at that level, or are you going to choose to work somewhere else? That's one. The other is to look at knowledge, skills, and abilities. Can that person be elevated in any of those? And if so, what do they need in terms of knowledge? What do they need to learn in terms of skills? How do we work with them to build their skill set? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we say, here's a piece of paper, learn it, now do it. Instead of, look, you know, we can offer a mentorship program. I would love it if you'd shadow this person for two weeks and then you're going to be better in your own job, right? Come back and tell me what you've learned every single day. And so we look at different styles. Of and, and you know what that means? That means people managers and, and structures becoming more flexible. Because yes. it's a lot about the deployment. It's about, and it's about using every opportunity for people to learn and grow and be engaged with one another and the organization. Exactly. Exactly. It is. I love that word, engagement with the organization. Engagement, absolutely. You know, that's what we're after. Ultimately, it is engagement. It's personal engagement. It's professional engagement. It's engagement with each other individually. It's engagement with a broader group. So really what we're doing is we are acting as models, right? And, and so where I said anybody can be a leader, I'm asking anybody in, in at any level of an organization to be the model of the best that they can be for that organization. Right. And if you're the, the CEO, you better be modeling it. You better show up with joy that this is what you love and this is where you're headed. Otherwise, get out. Are you in the wrong job or are you in the job wrong? And so wrap your head around that and and bring back the joy and that comes through I'm gonna talk about high performance again that comes through clarity greater clarity if you know where you're headed that's awesome mm -hmm. greater energy in an instant can you bring yourself back or are you feeling the slump in the afternoon and it's just terrible no you know what in an instant because you want to you can actually bring more energy the courage the courage to do the right thing, the courage to do the next thing, the courage to have that conversation. Imagine how much energy goes into holding you back because you might be afraid. Yeah. And this this is one of the key pieces around diversity and inclusion too. Definitely. Whether, you, know, you have the courage, being even the quietest voice in the room, do you have the courage to be heard, courage to speak? Right, and and so um, and that's the reason why uh, I'm excited about high performance being something that we see as a lever for talent innovation in the coming years, not just the month, coming months, coming years. Because if we are able to empower our talent to be high performers, based on what you have just described, right, uh, that both of us work on in terms of clarity, energy, courage, you know, productivity, you know, in presence their physiology, if every individual increases their performance by 2%, what shift that's going to be? You know, and yeah, and we are, so and we are not just depending on the leader to have that high performance shift, but we are, we are anticipating that if everybody has that 2% shift, imagine your millennials, your, your generation X, your baby boomers waking up to say that, hey, 
it's not time to retire. There's no retirement. I'm still engaged. I still love what I do. How much yeah. more energy, joy, and productivity and engagement the organization will have? And yeah. Right. It's, I love what I do and I'm contributing. Not, I love what I do, don't kick me out because I'm a certain age. It's, I love what I do and I've got this idea and I'm ready to lead that team mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, in it and I want to talk to this person and I'm, right, I'm, the ability for leaders to think beyond the boundaries that they had even, right? A lot of times people come into to companies with, um, that have specified roles and the ability to break out of those roles and to really uh, engage at all levels now is going to be what's hugely important. Right. I'm just king. I'm just seeing that I, we've, I just I put a poll out while we were having a conversation and uh, about um, them about the audience uh, okay. knowing what it takes to to build to build high performance. Right, okay. and, and, uh, and the answer is yes or no, and, and most of them come, and we have half, half, half say yes, half say, say no, so I think there's room for us to explore uh, uh, on another call with regards to high performance, and I trust those um, who are on the call with us right now will um, we'll just keep track when that particular one would be, because I think that would be one that is most interesting, um, at, at least for myself. Going forward, I see high performance for talent innovation and leadership. You know, yes. I see being uh, being a contemporary leader, uh, a leader that makes meaning for the people, being important in the midst of all the chaos and all the noise. Yes, I, yeah. I think you know it concerns me that it's fifty fifty because what that tells me is that there may be a misunderstanding about what high performance is. Right. Right. And so, how can everybody in a company be a high performer? Um, the truth is you're not going to have absolutely everybody. You are going to get some people who show up, they punch the clock, they do their work, they uh, punch out, they're done. Mm -hmm. You can get a majority of the workforce to be high performers within their realm. I'm not asking the mail clerk to lead the company, but I am asking that the mail clerk, if that person has an idea, that there's a way that that idea can be given to the next level up, the next level up, the next level up, and that that male clerk can be uh, can be recognized for contributing. It doesn't matter if it's a terrible idea. What matters is that there's a process, and I think that we need to be uh, really recognizing the uh, the generativity that that things. You know, when people contribute, it makes pe it makes the whole organization grow, and so it's really up to senior leaders to make sure that that's there at all levels. And and no, not everybody's going to come in and go, okay, I'm on, it's time. Um, but can you bring your own joy to whatever level, yes. whatever level you are in the organization? Yes. So yeah. So uh, being a high performer within your context. Uh, is, is actually, I think, one of the key pieces because that's where, where you interact on a day-to-day -day basis anyway, right? So right. for me, that that is important. I see, what else do I see going forward as important? I see um, the workplace getting increasingly diverse and virtual and therefore yeah. the ability for the organization to engage the talent pool through uh, inclusion, building inclusion, building skill set and uh, helping now this is helping people understand one another. You know, in the past we all we call this team building, but I like to say that it's not about team building. It's about looking at the entire thing about how do we build team effectiveness. Yes. Right. It's not just uh, rah rah build the team, but rather as a team through the process of work, if you like, um, how how effective are we? Yes. Because if everybody is contributing then we will be a highly effective team. And if everybody is a high performer, we have a high performing team. So the, the psychologist in me wants to talk a little bit. Yes, <laughs> all right. Right, so you used, a, you used a, a great term, and that was understanding. And uh, what I've seen, and I think the, there have been some good studies that back this up, is that the more we understand about 
others as individuals, the stronger we become as a team. The whole purpose of team building, which is a kind of a it's kind of a strange term, but the whole purpose of what used to be team building, can we work together, is to see how people work together. Those the games that people play during during team building exercises. What I found is that if you actually take people away from the workplace, or that even in virtual, if you if you invite conversations on a more personal level, that the work team becomes even stronger. There's a um, there's a, a book that I just read called the Checklist Manifesto, and what they talked about one of the things that they talked about was that even in moving through the checklist, making sure that things are done a certain way, that in order to make a anybody feel comfortable with stopping a process to be able to either contribute or to stop it because it's going wrong, that there has to be a level of familiarity. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important that that at any level in the organization we, we look at how can we build uh, a working knowledge of each other? How can we become friendly. We don't have to be best friends, but how can we become friendly and understand the other person to a degree that's that's not common in current workplaces now? Right. right. Um, we have a couple of moments left. So I just want to catch the last one because we didn't talk very much about this. And in the face of um, a talent shortage, um, the other piece that I see coming on very, very strongly, and, and the statistics show this, is that we're going to have an increased number of women in the yes. workplace, and women in the workplace at different levels of leadership. And, and I find this exciting because it, it, is a, it is coming to a point where we are seeing the kind of leadership that's needed in the organization and the kind of different voices that's needed in the boardroom, uh, and that women uh, is going to be an increasing um, resource that we will want to be tapping on. And how do we, again, bring them to the fore? Uh, we, we know that we, are, we have huge initiatives around diversity. But what efforts are we putting in in terms of building a culture of inclusion? You know, so that you yeah. can actually have the benefit of the diversity of thoughts. And that's a that's a great action step for our for our viewers. You know, that what that's a great question, I think, for our viewers. You know, remember, from my perspective, diversity has to do with uh, with the different perspectives that people bring to the organization, and that's based on their background, male, female, right, uh, different ethnicities. It, we've all come from different places. We all have different things to contribute. One of the key things that I look for is curiosity, right? I really, really boost that. Can you be curious? Can you stay curious? Can you uh, encourage curiosity and wonder? And um, doing that, I think, will help you bring the workplace together. I don't know how to get more women into the boardroom, but I think that being able to uh, say that that's a desire, I think, is the, is the first step. Yeah. I think it's, it's a process, and, and yep. it's going to be... And one thing I caution uh, when I work with organizations and they say we want more women in the workplace, I basically say let's first of all look at things that we can remove to allow your talent to rise. Because as you remove those barriers, women will begin to step up and women uh, in the various workplaces will, will step up based on the contribution and all. The second thing is that in any of this movement, the men needs to be involved. Definitely. Right, it, it's not a guerrilla warfare, and that's something that I, I always articulate. It's not a warfare. It's about how we can let our talent pool arise, and, and that's the role of, of the leaders. Agreed. All right, we have a couple of moments left. So, when um, to our, our our audience and listening in, what would be three things that you think moving forward in terms of talent innovation and leadership, they need to seriously consider? in order for them and their organizations to, to, to thrive and be able to cut through all the chaos and, and to really be able to be a sustainable business? Well, it's interesting. I think the, the first thing is really um, clarify who you are and, and where you're headed. And so really creating a, a very solid vision. That it is, you know, of the seven steps that I, that I look at, definition of self is really huge. You use the term flexibility. 
I think that's gigantic. I look at flexibility. I look at credibility. Are you doing what you say? Are you being flexible in how you get there? And the third is, are you acknowledging the team for the steps they're taking? I wanted to invite, before we conclude, I wanted to invite people to go to meaningmakerleadership.com and get the handout. There's a workbook that I have that will walk you through the seven steps. And, uh, you know, you'll go through definition of self, what's your direction. Uh, it, there's a little bit on courage. There's a little bit on your calling. Um, there are more. And I'd invite you to go meaningmakerleadership.com. And you can download a form. You can also download a form for a strategy session with me as a as a leadership coach, if that's something you're interested in. So, um, you know, that's again, Cheryl. That's what I'm seeing, and that's an offer for our viewing audience. Right. What I I would advocate for our, our audience to be looking at is really looking at your culture of flexibility, because that number one, it is not easily copied by your competitors. It becomes part of your competitive advantage. Build a culture of flexibility. It's, it's going to take time. And most of the time, I tell my clients, you take 12 to 15 months before you see the seed of, uh, of a new beginning, if you like. Um, the other area that I see uh, for talent innovation and, and leadership is people are tired. And therefore, if, you were to, if we were to be able to go in and show them that high performance is not going to make you more tired. High performance is going to make you more engaged, more joyful, and more um, fulfilled in what exactly. you are doing. That exactly. is going to do a long, go a long way in terms of talent and leadership engagement. The third thing that I see that is important is um, the valuing of inclusion. Um, and I, I don't think I, that, that more can be said because all of us would experience that the workplace we are having right now is no longer the homogeneous workplace that we used to have. But increasingly moving forward, there's going to be even more diversity in culture, gender and generations uh, and more. And, and inclusion becomes a key piece because people do not leave organizations. People leave their managers, people leave their teams. Agree. Agree. So, so that's where I see uh, for people managers, for, for leaders, those three pieces, flexibility, high performance and, and inclusion would be the three places that you would want to make sure you have innovative solutions to that. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's, what I, that's what I think and I see that smart organizations are moving in that direction. That's so, like, if you are based in Asia and if you need, a, you know, if you want to have a strategy session with me, um, you can find me at Cheryl at LiveWorks.Asia. So, very obviously, I'm based in Asia, and the, and the solutions and the strategies that I would be talking with you on would be very Asia effective uh, solutions. My name is Cheryl at LiveWorks.Asia. Um, and we can then have a, uh, you know, a session where we can look at how we can innovate in terms of your talent engagement and leadership development. Well, that's all the time we have. Um, Wayne, a pleasure to finally have this conversation. It's, a, it's been a, a true pleasure and I really look forward to new levels of success and happiness for you, for our leaders who are watching, uh, and for the work teams that are affected by the leaders that are watching. So, cool. This is Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Well, uh, for all of you out there, this is Talent Innovation 2015 with Cheryl, myself, Cheryl Liu Cheng, and Dr. Wayne Pennell. You can find us at Cheryl at LiveWorks.Asia. And Wayne, where can they reach you? They can reach me at... Uh, <laughs> Where can they reach me? Uh, I'm going to give you my Gmail account, actually. there's uh, I do have a business account, but it goes through the Gmail. It's just easier to get right through it. It's Wayne Purnell, W-A-Y-N-E, Purnell, P-E-R-N-E-L-L, Wayne Purnell at gmail.com. It comes right to me. So um, that just that's, that's sort of the inside track to get to me. So right. if you want to write me there, that's great. Okay, so on behalf of Wayne, um, my name is Cheryl, CEO of LifeWorks, founder of the 24-Hour Woman. Thank you so much for joining us for Talent Innovation 2015. We look forward to seeing you again in any of our online and offline events. See you soon and have a great day.